Hello humans, welcome back to my guide to force vector design and the second episode of the series. This time we're going to be discussing how FBD++ handles rolling and how this is different than what you might expect. Before we get too deep into the roll, let's talk part lines, as the two together are what gives many coasters their characteristic shaping and overall aesthetic. The heart line of a coaster is a point set between the rails and raised or lowered to the approximate height of the rider's heart. This becomes a line as the track moves through the ride. The track then rotates about this line instead of the center of the rails. This allows the track to rotate around the rider's center of mass instead of the riders being flung around the track as it rotates, allowing for a much more complex element shapes to be executed, higher forces to be applied, and a much more intense, but safe, overall roller coaster experience. The byproduct of this is eye candy for the enthusiast, creating the unique, modern roller coaster shapes we often see today. The height of this heart line is dependent upon roller coaster type, as riders still sit at different heights above or below the rails on different roller coaster types. The conversions window within FED++ contains many of the default values we can find in No Limits. I'm using an older version of FED++ for some of the older features that have been done away with, so I don't have all of the roller coaster types here, and some of them are flat out incorrect. The X car value, for instance, is actually measured with imperial units instead of metric, and is 4.25 feet, or 1.295 meters, instead of the 1.3 meters we see here. A subtle difference, but important if you're using the default values within the simulator. You can measure the heartline value yourself within the simulator by setting the heartline to default and choosing the spline option in the editor window and measuring a beam that extends from the rails to the spline. In some rare instances, roller coaster manufacturers have experimented with this value slightly. If you know the exact heartline value you need for a ride, and it does not exactly match with the no limits default, you can set a custom heartline value. Just be sure that these values match between FED++ and no limits, whether using a custom heartline or the default value. In the no limits editor, when we place a roll node and set a roll for a point, the editor will calculate the smoothest rolling action between the nodes. This changes for each node as we add more nodes. Setting the roll at a point is as easy as typing in the value, setting the value incrementally using the various plus and minus buttons, or by using the no lateral g-forces button. In FED++, however, we aren't setting the roll to any specific value, but rather allow the roll to be the value it needs to be in order to meet the criteria we have set with the normal and lateral forces along with the roll rate. This roll rate will either be a rate over time or a rate over distance. We change this with the function with respect to value and can only do so for force and geometric section. I will use a geometric section to demonstrate both, but know that we typically use time for force sections and distance for geometric sections. I'll explain why as we go and when it becomes applicable. Before I explain roll rates though, I'll quickly go over geometric sections so we are familiar with everything we are looking at and understand the basic function of the geometric sections. Unlike the normal and lateral graphs we see in force sections, we now have a pitch and yaw option. Also unlike the force section, the pitch, yaw, and roll act independently of each other no matter the value of any of the others. Pitch is always up and down, yaw is always side to side, and the roll rolls the track around the heart line like we expect. No longer do we have a rotating and translating reference frame within an inertial frame we have to think about. Using geometric sections would be extremely limiting if designing a B&M invert or an Intamin Blitz coaster, but it's right at home when designing Woody's. Spoilers for the upcoming episode featuring geometric sections. For now, I'll be using the section type for demonstration of the roll as it is easier to single out the roll without the need to adjust the other inputs. I'll start with a straight segment so we have a reference and starting point to get some speed and ensure that the function with respect to value is set to time. Just like before, I'm going to single out the roll by setting the pitch and yaw to dynamic so that they will stretch as much as needed to keep up with the roll, and I'll hide them again to clean things up. Creating a cubic function and erasing the value begins to rotate the ride to some value of degrees per second. We then extend this out to get an idea of what happens to the rolling as time passes on. We notice that, from riding between the rails, the riders will feel this rolling as consistently fast in the beginning as they do the end, even though the rolls appear to get tighter as the track keeps rolling. 
What's going on here is the coaster is slowly losing speed due to friction, and so the constant degrees per second we set are happening over shorter and shorter distances. You could think of it being analogous to bouncing a basketball once every second while running, and again once every second while walking. The distance between bounces will be shorter while walking, as we simply don't cover as much distance over the same amount of time. Creating the same basic setup, but this time using the function with respect to distance, reveals a much different rolling action. Now, the rolling looks to be evenly spread out, and riding in between the rails shows the rolling action slowing down for the riders as we progress through the element. In this case, we are bouncing the ball as we gradually walk slower, keeping the distance between the bounces the same. Whether we choose time or distance is the question then, and depends on the application. If we're making a JoJo roll, for instance, we would want to use time with a geometric section so the rolling is consistent throughout the element. If we're making something akin to Volcano the Blast Coaster though, we'll choose distance with a geometric section, as the rolling with the rider's perspective seems to slow with the slowing train. You can make either of these with a four section, but using a geometric section simplifies things greatly. The choice then comes down to the experience we're trying to give riders. If we want a consistent rolling action through all of the elements, we'll typically choose time. And if we want more variation from the natural differences in shaping, we'll go with distance. Experiment with each as you design your rides and make a mental note of how each combination feels to you. With some basic understanding of how rolling works, let's cover some of the limitations it has. Rolling a roller coaster comes with two things we should consider. Can the cars physically roll through this track? And will this rolling cause any unwanted forces to be induced on the riders? Let's talk about the riders first as rider safety is the number one priority. When we set a force to zero in FDD++, this is only true for the point mass that is the center of the train at the center of the heart line. We have yet to account for the length of the train and, usually, the fact that riders are sitting either to the left or the right of the center of the track, sometimes a considerable distance away from it. If the train is actively rolling through a point, it will cause some lateral g-forces no matter how gentle we try to be. This is minimized by setting the heart line correctly, but can never be eliminated due to the nature of rolling motion. Thankfully, our intuition can lead us in the right direction, as this effect is more drastic the more aggressive and quickly turning the section of track we are working on is, so we know where to be more careful, and where we can get away with ignoring it. As you design and test your rides, you'll begin to learn where this line is. The line is wide and very gray, and varies depending on ride type because of heart line placement and element choice, and overall intensity. There is way too much nuance to cover in a single video, but I hope this gives you the tools to reason through whatever you're trying to make. If you're still having trouble, don't be afraid to voice that in the forum topic I've created for this. I, or any of the many experienced enthusiasts over at No Limit Central would be delighted to help. I'll quickly cover the other limitation, the physical limitation, as this is easier to see, understand, and fix. The coaster car that seats riders is set on top of a bogey, a wheel assembly guiding the train along the track. Some bogey setups are free to move per individual car, such as the Vacoma and B&M trains, giving them a huge range of motion, limited not by rolling but by pitch and yaw. Others, like what is found on PTC trains, have a different setup, which is limited by all three, pitch, yaw, and roll. It's easy to see how the cars could be pinched together by the pinch and yaw, but might be harder to see how the roll could be a problem here. Note that the front wheels of this Woody have no freedom to rotate and are locked with the car but the wheels in the back are free to rotate. The problem arises when this back assembly is rotated so quickly that the wheels make contact with the car. We will visually see this as a wheel poking out over the part of the train that riders will step on to get in and out of the car. The solution is simple though. Simply run back through the element in FDD++ and slow down the rolling in those spots, adjusting the shaping as needed, and test again until the wheel no longer protrudes. When building wooden roller coasters in FED++, I always check this as I go to ensure I don't miss any and have to start over again. With the basics of rolling firmly under our belts, we can start thinking about how the roll will interact with the other forces to create our roller coasters. I'll demonstrate more vertical interactions with a curving drop and more horizontal interactions with a helix, potentially the start and end of your ride. For the curve drop, I'll start similarly as I've done before and set the lateral force and roll rate to dynamic so they stretch with the normal force. I'll hide the lateral force again as we won't be needing to change anything there. 
Before we get too hasty and excited to work with the force section, we should set an appropriate speed for the pre-drop. We may think that lowering the normal force to zero is the first step here since we want to go down like we did with the hyper coaster in the last episode, but this isn't necessary here as there is another force that is already zero, the lateral force. Since we're turning the track anyway, we know that the lateral force will be pointing more down than horizontally at some point, with respect to gravity of course, so our coaster will fall when we turn the track. We start with a cubic function to get the roll started and extend it out using the normal force. Small note here, I like to adhere everything to the normal force as I find it easier to gauge what the track will do as I extend it out. This also makes rolling adjustments appear further down the track as you make changes. I would encourage you to develop your own style though if things aren't working for you like this. We all think of things and tackle problems slightly differently. You may find yourself more at home adhering everything to the roll instead. The 1G of normal force this section started with is just a smidge too much and keeps this turn very tight but backing it off slightly helps coax the curve in a natural way as it dives downward. Adding another cubic roll function that goes past 0 degrees per second turns the track back the other way so we can level things out. We can round out the drop with some positive normal force and stop the rolling motion with a cubic returning to 0 degrees per second, adjusting the length values here to end up near 0 degrees by the value of the drop. And with those few basic ideas put together, a nice, smooth B&M drop is made. You can fidget and mess with these values to your heart's content and you're happy with the shaping. Experiment with faster rolling at different parts, stretching the normal force to apply the forces more quickly or gently, or do the same with the roll rate and feel out how time stretching works here. You've got the basic tools to start here. Now it's up to you to experiment and really dial in your craft. After a bit more time, here is my drop put through the simulator. An upward helix is a seemingly simple element to create, but has some nuance that we want to be mindful of in order to execute the element smoothly and without pumping. We're aiming for a circular helix that spirals upward, so we'll have to keep the speed of the coaster in mind as we progress through the element. I start with a quartic function to get an idea of how much rolling needs to be applied to get the coaster nearly sideways, while applying the maximum normal force that is at the bottom of the helix. Extending things out starts to reveal our helix, but it isn't quite a helix yet. It does curve upward to begin with, but then dips back down again. We also notice that the radius just gets tighter instead of staying circular. Let's get the helix moving upward first, and we'll do that by adjusting how we approach this initial roll. Instead of one quartic function, I will use two cubic functions to mimic nearly the same shape. This time, I'm going to go slightly past zero degrees per second so that the train unrolls as it goes upward in the helix. We have to remember that we are maintaining zero lateral force throughout this turn and so have to compensate elsewhere. The amount that we need to unroll to counteract this increases as we lose speed going up the helix, so we lower the cubic function spanning the length of the helix as well. These increments are quite small and will need to be fiddled with extensively to get your helix perfect. What we have now is great if we would like to gray out or black out riders with sustained 4Gs of downward force. So we implement the natural solution and circularize this helix a bit further. We can think of this much like how we approach the valley of the hypercoaster from the first episode. We want to gradually change the force so that the track follows a circular path. In this case, it isn't gravity that is changing as we move through the element, it is the speed. So it is as simple as lowering the normal force gradually through the helix with a cubic function as the coaster slows down. This is still a fairly intense helix, but the shaping is much improved with an easy to implement change. We could lower the forces overall depending on the length of our helix and how intense we want things to be. After some work, here is my helix run through the simulator. Congratulations, you now have all of the tools you need to create your roller coaster using four sections. Okay, I know it's not going to be that simple for everyone, but I promise that it is true. The only thing left to do is to practice and experiment with how these graphs influence the shape of your roller coaster. Take things slowly. Run your ride through the simulator after every element you design and run it through as you make changes. 
As you do this, place the camera in places where you can see the train bending, moving, and rotating as it flies through your track, and note places where things look good and where things look bad. The more you work with it and observe the things that happen when you make changes, the better you'll become. Don't get discouraged either. It took me several hundred attempts, at the very least, to really figure things out. I've tried to summarize the concepts I found most helpful in my journey. There is much more that can be applied though, so we could certainly dive deeper in the comments section of any of these videos or the forum topic I've created, which you can find in the description. I hope that I have provided a good kickstart to your process of understanding force vector design. This won't stop here, but I will take a small step to the side to dive deeper into geometric sections and then a quick tangent into how to blend force sections with geometric sections and vice versa before going to more specific element shaping. So stick around, we have much more to learn, but I want to see you going out there and practicing right away. You have everything you need to make something great. Thank you again for tuning in, and until next time, be safe, be healthy, be kind.